This is a reading from a book called The United States Navy in World War II, compiled and edited by S. E. Smith and published by Ballantine Books. Aboard Lieutenant Commander Ralph M. Ramey's destroyer McCook, as it engaged in a duel with guns emplaced in the vicinity of Vierville, was the Saturday Evening Post foreign editor Martin Summers, an early product of the New York Daily News copy desk. Summers covered the war in the Atlantic and Pacific theaters. He was almost always under fire, as we find him now. The Longest Hour in History by Martin Summers. This was the first hour of D-Day, and we were crossing an area where we were under shore guns with a lot more firepower than we possessed. We could see the grim black shoreline plainly. We couldn't fire before H hour minus 40 minutes or 5.50 a.m. unless we were fired upon. During the wait, Lieutenant Jerry Clancy, an Annapolis man from Jersey City, shook his head and murmured, what I can't understand is why they don't fire on us. None of us could understand it, and we all wished they would start firing so we could start firing back. That would be much better than waiting. We were getting mildly edgy because we were also expecting a terrific bombing attack from the air. A few sweeps detached themselves from their group and loomed directly ahead of our bow. They were our personal own, and they were to lead us to the bombardment area. They would not take us all the way in, but they would take us to 5,000 yards offshore. From there, we were on our own, and we were to creep in to 3,500 yards to take up our firing station. We proceeded to a position directly off Vierville sur mer To starboard, our particular front ranged to the powerful shore battery at Pointe du Hoc, in the direction of Grand Comp. Port side, our assault front extended to Port en Bessin, where the British landings were to begin. A reverent chorus of awes ran through the ship to announce the beginning of the air bombardment. To starboard and to port, thunderous explosions rolled along the shore, followed by high bursts of multicolored flak, and then a geyser of flame here, another there. It was not yet three o'clock. The bombing was on time after all. The blasts were coming so fast that they merged into one roar. The shoreline became a broken necklace of flame. Now the Krauts are letting go with their rocket guns. They get some planes directly over our beach. That means we are going to have a lot of gun emplacements to work over. Now a bright orange glow spreads over the entire coastline. When it's orange blossom time in Normandy, somebody sings softly on the bridge. We are now reaching our bombardment station 3,500 yards offshore. It's just 4.30. We've got an hour to wait, Skipper Ramey says. We can see his easy grin through the darkness. He probably is wondering how his officers are going to like it. Although a third of the enlisted men on the McCook are veterans of battles and sinkings in the South Pacific, only one other officer aboard has previously seen full-dress naval action. As we lay dead in the water, the choppy little waves slapping the thin steel sides of our can seem to repeat, Why don't they fire? Why don't they fire? Why don't they fire? We try hard to make conversation about the air bombardment, which has grown monotonous and is now waning temporarily. It has been cold on the bridge throughout the night, but now it seems twice as cold as ever before. I guess this is about the longest hour in history, one of the lookouts says. It is all right. Twenty minutes gone and forty to go. Thirty minutes gone. Well, no other half hour can be as long. Now, in the cloudy haze, we note that the Glasgow and the Texas are taking their positions behind us. Everything is ready except the ship's clock. The captain is carefully studying the clock. One tremendous roar shakes the sea for miles around. We blink and steady ourselves. That must be the Glasgow and the Texas.
It is. Now, Gunnery Officer Jim Arnold, in his fire control tower atop the flying bridge, gets the word he's been waiting to hear. Our five-inch guns speak as one, and to us they seemed louder and truer than any we've ever heard. Our first salvo is low on the first designated target. Arnold quickly works out the problem anew. The guns are corrected and our third salvo sends a pillbox cascading into the air in fragments. Pillbox does not convey what some of these things the Germans call Stutzpunktgruppe really are. They can be as big as a New England town hall, with walls six feet thick, and most of them are stocked with food, water, and ammunition sufficient to support a sizable defense force for months. Within a few short minutes on automatic fire, we get our second target and attempt our third. This one is a battery cunningly concealed behind a stone wall down a gulch curving away from the sea. A salvo below, a salvo above, a salvo to the left. This fellow is really stubborn. Jim Arnold's lean, sensitive face now is twisted into something approaching a snarl. His long fingers adjust his instruments. For this moment, the scholar has become a killer. The next salvo smashes the gun and sends it down the gulch, starting a minor avalanche. By 6.15, all our assigned targets that we can reach have been knocked out or previously demolished by air bombing. We have fired 200 rounds in 25 minutes of automatic firing. Sir, suggest we shift to targets of opportunity? Arnold phones the bridge. Targets of opportunity are those enemy surprises that bob up, those strong points we don't know about in advance. There will be plenty of them. Permission granted. Lines of amphibious tanks are churning their way to the beaches in formation. They skim along so smoothly and gracefully that they appear to be some sort of prehistoric mammals rather than man-made machines. A destroyer to starboard of us has been hit and is pulling out. We take over her targets. Now we have time to examine the beaches. Our landing at low tide has eliminated automatically the underwater horrors which we'd expected. Steel hedgehogs, pyramids of concrete, huge wooden stakes, and the dread tetrahedral traps. They are high and dry on the beach, easy marks for the demolition squads now long at work. But the beach is small, very small a bottleneck between vast stretches of cliff on either side. Everything will have to come across the small beach, a target for the Kraut gunners. We must knock out all their guns and do it fast. Between 6.25 and 6.30, the most beautiful and most heart-rending spectacle of the day is enacted overhead. Flying fortresses come over to finish off troublesome spots inland by precision bombing. They risk flying lower than they should to be sure of sending their solid best on D-Day. Flame and smoke spout from one fort. It flounders and circles pathetically, losing altitude. We feel acute pain watching. One last feeble spiral and the fort nose dives earthward a burst of flame and a geyser of smoke beyond the cliffs. That is all. Another fort goes the same way. Now three. Now four. During the next two days we are to spend sweating it out with the troops who are taking a shelling on the beach. Nothing cuts quite so deeply as the sight of those four beautiful forts going to glory. We cruise backward and forward along the shore searching for targets. There are large splashes off the starboard bow, and a lookout shouts that we are being bracketed by big guns ashore. But the splashes are not repeated, and we never know whether we've been aimed at. We learn that another destroyer has been badly knocked around and is on her way out. Confusion on the beach has increased. Tanks and infantry seem to us to be milling around aimlessly. Tanks should be climbing up the single winding road leading from the beach to the good highway on the cliffs. 
but some tanks are burning, and German fire seems to have increased, though we cannot spot the batteries. Rear Admiral Carlton F. Bryant, who is spark-plugging the bombardment from the Texas, calls all destroyers over the intership radio phone. Get on them, men! Get on them! We must knock out those guns. They're raising hell with the men on the beach, and we can't have any more of that. We must stop it. Grove, do you see anything? Our watch officer asks plaintively. Grove is Seaman 2nd Class Gerald Grove, 38, of Clarinda, Iowa, who looks old enough to be the father of half the seamen aboard, and who also looks as though he would feel much more at home milking cows back on the farm than spotting enemy guns in battle from the bridge of a pitching can. Grove is married and the father of an 11-year-old daughter. He never expected to be drafted, but after his induction, he did his best to make himself a seaman, although he did seem a little old for the game. On the McCook, he became the ship's barber, but Skipper Ramey discovered that the Iowa farmer had the best pair of eyes on the ship, phenomenally keen sight, so Grove is now the star lookout. There are times when a good lookout is worth exactly eight million dollars worth of destroyer and 300 lives. So when the chips are down on the McCook, it is, Grove, do you see anything? Grove sees something this time. He sees a few faint flashes from a stone house tucked away up the gulch within range of the vital road from the beach. And these flashes coincide with the explosion of shells setting our beach-bound tanks ablaze. Range is established and our guns go to work. They blast away pieces of the cliff all around the stone house. Finally, a direct hit. A gun tumbles stern over tea kettle from the wreckage. Well done. Well done, comes the formal commendation from Admiral Bryant. At least three-fourths of the officers aboard and half the men have served on the cookie boat since she was commissioned, and their pride is now boundless. All afternoon we try to find hidden enemy rocket gun batteries, which are shellacking our tanks and soldiers as they mill about on the beaches. Naval fire gets some, but the beach is not a pretty picture, with considerable destruction in evidence everywhere, and medical corpsmen flashing messages for help in evacuating casualties. We have knocked out three big pillboxes and six guns, a recapitulation shows as night falls. We now must expect a full night of bombing by the Luftwaffe, and we cannot expect much protection. The skipper isn't worried. I spent a whole year ducking the Japs, and I guess I can manage to duck the Luftwaffe for one night, he says. All night long, nobody sleeps. As we maneuver to and fro among the darkest patches of the channel area, the Luftwaffe is overhead from time to time, but by no means in strength, and only a few ships in the transport area are casualties. We are very happy to see the second invasion dawn, and again we get to work trying to find those troublesome enemy batteries. By noon, the picture on the beach has changed greatly. Our tanks and troops of the big one, the famous 1st Division, have moved up the road and are fighting a few miles inland. Our people have done wonders unloading during the night, and order now emerges from what appeared to be the beginning of chaos on the beach. We close down on every enemy flash until nightfall, and as a finale after dark, we help the boys ashore knock out the village of Longville some miles inland from where German artillery is shelling our beachhead. The flames from the village light up the sky just at the moment our much reinforced anti-aircraft opens up on Nazi bombers, which are once more overhead. Once again the skipper maneuvers through the night up and down the coast. We are then ordered to return to our home port for reloading and refueling at first light. Our score is three big assigned targets and ten targets of opportunity. And now Jim Arnold can untangle his long legs, climb from his fire control turret, and go below for a couple hours of shut-eye before he must supervise the loading of ammunition in England. We boil homeward at 30 knots, leaving a waterfall in reverse six feet high in our wake. 
We pass miles and miles of France-bound supply ships as we race through the sea highway, which is the beginning of our road to Berlin. The sun is climbing in a cloudless sky, and the world at six o'clock this morning of June 8, 1944, seems a very different place from what it did 48 hours ago.